Hey, welcome to the Kevin Navani Connection Show. I have a very special guest, Drew Banzal, who is the CSO of Unchained Capital. He wrote a three-part series on the you know, on the future history of first contact between human and alien blockchains. And in the first part, he defined, you know, the first law of Bitcoin astronomy and describes, you know, how it leads to new blockchains as humanity expands through the solar system. And in part two, he describes a second law, which leads to nested blockchain, the size of solar systems and beyond hashing vast energies and cosmic timescales. And in part three, which my focus is on, is in a series of speculations about the hyper Bitcoinized future. So without further ado, this is my talk with Drew Bansal. You're going to love it. We're going to go deep down the rabbit hole. Uh, we're going to try to talk about you know, the cosmos, the universe, about Bitcoin, about um, energy, about all kinds of uh, you know, really essential questions, which are rather you know, ignored or not being really talked about. We're going to talk about you know, space, thermodynamics, and uh, you know, high, the, the process of hyper-Bitcoinization eventually. So yeah, have fun. Enjoy this episode and let me know what you think. Uh, make sure you follow me on Twitter and also Drew Banzal on, on Twitter. Uh, read his articles, uh, which I'm going to post in the sh uh, show notes. And uh, yeah, you're going gonna to love this and let me know what you think. Drew Banzal, welcome to the show. How are you doing, man? <laughs> I'm very well. Thank you for having me, k -Bon. We finally made it. So uh, listen, uh, Drew, I've uh, been following you for s quite some time, read your amazing articles and listened to a bunch of uh, podcasts and interviews with you. And uh, I love, you know, your approach, you know, to to technology. Maybe you could, you know, just just uh, tell a little bit my listeners, like what's your background? Because your background is really interesting. You, you come from a very technological uh, background into and and you know and turned into a CSO of Unchained Capital. Can you tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, I, I grew up um, wanting to be a physicist. I think I got the bug early in my life, maybe twelve or thirteen. It just struck me as a very uh, a career of the mind. You know that one could go study the most interesting problems that are out there, and it also struck me as the kind of thing where you would have a lot of freedom. I think as a young man, I was very I was not looking forward to, you know, the work like nine to five kind of office schedule or culture or something. I don't know. I had a lot of misperceptions perhaps around how free and, and um, uh, about what the lives of professors and stuff were like. I think I had a little bit of a romantic notion perhaps of what a physicist's life would be like. Um, but regardless, I pursued that. But yeah, I tried to become a physicist. Um, went, to, went to college, studied physics and mathematics, um, started programming, went to graduate school for uh, physics trying to get my phd down here in austin um i think in the middle of that process or i i, I it's sort of relevant i my the subject matter er, that i focused on was statistical mechanics so i wasn't a physicist studying you know um uh, heavy or uh, excuse me high energy physics and a collider or something like that at cern or, or whatever that's that's very cool but that's not what i was doing i was studying statistical mechanics so really big complicated systems, what patterns emerge, what what tendencies and, and what tools of physics perhaps can we use to analyze. And in particular, I was applying the, those methodologies to analyze systems outside of physics frequently. So human systems, social dynamical systems, looking at networks, looking at large scale data. So I was learning to program against a lot of data. Um, it was fun for me. Um, I liked the work, uh, but I don't think I was particularly maybe the greatest physicist. I wasn't maybe emotionally or mentally cut out for it. I found it, um, uh, I found a, a lot of parts of it difficult. I, I think I always liked learning about physics, but maybe I wasn't the best researcher. Maybe I was just young, I'm not sure. Um, but regardless, uh, eventually an, an opportunity kind of came along for me, which is I met uh, my co-founder of Unchained Capital, Joe Kelly, as well as a third uh, gentleman, Flip Cromer, who, be, who the three of us co-founded a company called InfoChamps while I was getting my PhD program or, or PhD in physics down here in Austin. Um, uh, that third gentleman was Flip Cromer. He was also a physics PhD student or w was in and out of the program, maybe I should say. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then Joe was a dropout from the business school. Um, and then eventually I dropped out from the physics to PhD. So basically we were three dropouts that all met uh, through the physics PhD program here at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and we started the data company. So I, I had the kind of this physics background and I was learning to program against large amounts of data and Flip had a big passion around that. 
And um, so we decided to start this uh, data company that will kind of liberate the world's data. This is around 2008. And I decided um, that it was a really fun project for me because I had learned how difficult it was to obtain data um, for my research. And I wanted to make it easier to share data with other researchers. And I wanted to build, um, you know, an inverse Google. You know, Google eats the world's data and they, they, they'll, they'll give you anything you want for free, but never the data. Um, because that's what they, they realize that's their, that's their real uh, um, moat is having the world's data and learning from it and learning about the world that way. So I wanted to make um, something more open that scientists could access. Um, but that's not what our company ultimately wound up building. We wound up building distributed data software. So big databases, and Hadoop and NoSQL. Um, if, you're, if, if your audience has ever heard of those terminologies, that's stuff that came out of Google um, that helps uh, pro programmers and developers program and manipulate huge, huge, huge amounts of data. So that's what the company got good at. And that brought me into distributed systems. So I really started to understand how you can build a database that has you know, no leader. Every node is the same and somehow it can scale to store you know, all the photos that Facebook holds or, or whatever you'd like. Um, but crucially, right, those distributed systems were always centralized in some way, and, or, or rather they were centrally managed, right? There were some systems administrator at Facebook or in my, or my company, InfoChamps, that was managing these databases and ensuring that they all, importantly, I think for what comes later in our conversation, perhaps, ensuring that they all had the same time configured, that they all were, like, weren't hackable, they all were doing the same thing and, and, and cooperating, um, um, it's a non-adversarial context, but it's, I learned a lot about distributed systems. And then we sold the company in 2013. For the first time in my life, I made some money that I could afford to lose. Bought some Bitcoin with it because I didn't know any better. And that turned out to be a great idea. Um, over the years, uh, Bitcoin kind of became a synthesis for me of like um, distributed system stuff that I was working on with InfoChamps. Bitcoin is a fantastically interesting distributed system. And I recognized it as a distributed system right away. Um, I didn't really understand too much about Bitcoin, the money. That's an area that I didn't have as much expertise in, but that, that's been fun for me is, is learning more about that. Um, but then also I think, you know, Bitcoin has some physics in it somewhere. It's, it's, it's a physical system in the world that uses energy that's bounded by the speed of light as I've written about um, at length. So on some level, Bitcoin for me is like an apotheosis of all the different parts of my career um, heretofore kind of put together at once. That's why it's so challenging and fascinating for me. Now, when you got um, very fascinating your story, uh, when you got in touch with Bitcoin for the first time, when you um, did you understand like the fundamentals of Bitcoin and what it, what it could mean for human civilization for humanity? Because before we go, you know, into the rabbit hole of of Bitcoin astronomy, the, this amazing article or the three part series I think was uh, that you wrote about. You wrote you wrote a bunch of articles. I mean that I've read like in the last months about Bitcoin data science, t dust and th thermodynamics or uh, the, the estimates of how many Bitcoins uh, could have been lost uh, somewhere between 2.78 and 3.79, I think, Bitcoin. Um, okay, so my question is, what, what, what was it? What was the vision? What was like, what did you see in Bitcoin that can uh, facilitate, enable or, or accelerate, you know, for humanity? And I'm, I'm sorry if you hear a little siren behind me. You know, I did mention at the top of the call that I live yeah. across the street from the fire station. <laughs> no I think this is just a police car downtown. Let me know if it's too loud and maybe we'll wait for it to pass. Yeah, I can. I can. I hope you can edit this. I can edit it for <laughs> sure, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So I would say my first reactions to Bitcoin were pretty skeptical. Uh, I think most people who hear about Bitcoin, you should be skeptical the first time you hear about it because it sounds far-fetched. It sounds unrealistic, it sounds naive, it sounds like angels on a pinhead, it sounds impractical. Um, I had, I had uh, um, and I think furthermore, the, the, the reason that I think sometimes people remain skeptical even after they first hear about it is because Bitcoin is an extremely interdisciplinary idea. It is, it is a money, but it's also technology. Um, it's a political identity increasingly. Um, it, it is intersectional um, in, in, in so many ways. And that makes it so that if you only have expertise or background in one of these areas, you come at it as a computer scientist, or as you come at it as an economist, or if you come at it as a banker, um, you might perceive some aspects of it and why it's valuable, but it's difficult for you to realize the totality of what of how new, novel, interesting, and transformative Bitcoin is, because you're not an expert in all the world's fields. No one is. Part of what's so interesting and cool about Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoiners, is that spurred on by trying to understand Bitcoin, we wind up having to understand bits and pieces of cryptography, you know, monetary theory, the, the history 
of, of, of you know, the modern banking system. There, there's so many intertwined threads that make Bitcoin's story work and, and underlies value proposition. So I think for me, um, not having a lot of money at the time, not understanding banking or, or, econ or truthfully economics very well or monetary policy, certainly. I had, I had never heard of Austrian economics. I didn't know, I'm talking about the way, the first time I heard about Bitcoin is, is I should have said this up front in 2011 or so. Um, so this era, you know, um, I know a lot about distributed systems by this point, but I don't know anything about money at all. And, and, I, and I was incurious about it. I had never really asked, hey, how does the Federal Reserve work? I thought the Federal Reserve was part of the federal government, you know, like most people uh, in the United States probably think. Um, so I was very naive in those areas. And the person who presented money, uh, Bitcoin to me was also a technologist. Like it was at a conference and they were very knowledgeable. Um, they were mathematician. And they worked in technology and they were interested in Bitcoin. They had read about it. They understood it very well. But again, they explained it to me like it's a, like more technologically, like how does proof of work work and, and, and chains of signatures and these kinds of ideas. And I perceived it as a database um, that like was trying to be a money or something like that. And I, and I recognized, I think, because I already understood about distributed systems and the cap theorem and how, how consensus and, and how, how essentially... Yeah, when things are spread out, it takes time for a state to propagate across all their parts. It's kind of a trivial statement, but um, I, so I understood the challenges of building database, storing data in, in those models. And, and you know, Bitcoin ultimately is a kind of data set; it's a ledger. Um, and so I appreciated how interesting the solution was, but it struck me as kind of like an impractical, you know, it, the kind of like uh, if you've ever heard of the, the programming language Brainfuck. This is it's it's a programming language that's designed to be. A fun in joke for programmers. No one writes applications in Brainfuck, or at least no one should. It's not intended to be readable. In, in, in fact, you can tell from the names, intended to just be a puzzle for your brain to work out. Like getting Brainfuck to print Hello World is like a very complex program that's inscrutable to most humans, but that's the fun of it for programmers. And that was my reaction. I think a little bit about it. I'm like, this sounds like some like Rube Goldberg machine that you've built to store data that just seems like, I don't know who's, what, who has the problem you're solving was, was kind of my reaction, right? Like, cool idea, bro, but like, totally impractical, not going to work. It also helps the price of Bitcoin at the time was less than a dollar. So there's no economic reality to this thing for me to be curious about, or at least it felt, it felt like that way at the time. I think I've spoken with other Bitcoiners who heard about Bitcoin in a similar time period and immediately were like, oh, I'm, you know, I see like the money, the money aspects of this, but like, I don't believe any of the claims you're making. Like, uh, what does cryptography have to do with this? You know, like, so you can see how different people like, like, I didn't understand what a sound money, like, why is it useful? I, I, I perceived how the Bitcoin supply could be limited, like, in the theoretical sense that was described to me, but I didn't see why that was valuable. The I absolute scarcity, people... did, you, did you get that, like, in 2011? Like, did, did that, like, make a click for you, like, the absolute scarcity, or did you, did you get that later? I, got, I understood this, the feedback, the, the sort of self-referential nature of proof of work and Bitcoin construction. Like, I totally, I, I understood that part. Um, and I understood it as a kind of like, because uh, the way that was presented to me was like a symmetry breaking, time breaking like thing. That's often how databases have to solve this problem, right? They get two conflicting pieces of information, uh, you know, update this value, delete this value. Um, which one should they do? It ultimately becomes a ordering problem, right? All databases have to solve a problem. How should I order mutations to the data that I hold locally? So that's how I, um, for me, interpreted what Bitcoin was trying to do. It was like, okay, so every node keeps a copy of the entire data set, which I thought was absurd. And then so every node has to figure out how to order every single change, even though they're going to arrive in totally different orders. And then I understood that, okay, you have a essentially a point of centralization. Like um, there was a technology at the time called Hadoop. Um, and you, you have a map and a reduce phase in Hadoop. It's kind of a, it's a framework for doing distributed computations. And the reduce phase of a Hadoop um, a map reduce algorithm, it's called. The reduce phase is essentially where you co-locate a bunch of information. And co-location is important in computer science because that's how you calculate and sum and do aggregations and reporting and all the things you care about when you're doing analytics at scale. So similarly, I thought of the Bitcoin mining process as a reducer, a kind of aggregation point for all the world's changes in which now I, I wouldn't have said it as eloquently perhaps at the time, but like the changes that live in the mempool they get aggregated into these blocks. That's a reducer and the reducer like runs and then like writes to the data. Like, so I can understand all that. That's its way of breaking the symmetry. But again, I was like, this is so dumb. Who cares? Like you, this is the most complicated thing I've ever heard of. It seems pointless. So it was lost on me um, why Bitcoin was useful at the time, though I could understand how it worked. I didn't know what it was for. 
Okay. Um, before, you know, I, I mentioned, you know, the, the article that you wrote on, um, on medium.com, uh, because the other articles are on, uh, are on Unchained Capital. I think we have since moved all those articles to the Unchained blog. To the Unchained Capital, okay. Yeah, they exactly. All, yeah. Research from them if you like. So uh, before we go into this article, which is the focus of, of our talk today, or I would want to, <laughs> is um, like how many coins are a potential really lost and what, what would that mean from your perspective for the, you know, total value um, or market capitalization, or the the power or purchasing power of Bitcoin. Uh. Interesting. Um, so again, I, I, I there are way better estimates now that have come out. Like the estimate that I put out um, in one of the data science articles that I that I wrote that you can find on the blog is a very rough estimate. What I liked about it is how few assumptions it tried to make about the behavior of Bitcoin users or. Um, addresses on the chain or any, any kind of fine way. It was a very, very rough calculation just based on saying, well, how much like if Bitcoin is like 10 years old, how much of it is nine years old? Well, that's just probably lost. Um, it's just very, very simple back of the envelope kind of number that you could calculate. It's a very physics approach to solving this problem. Well, we don't know anything, so let's make a order of magnitude estimate. So my order of magnitude estimate at the time was I think somewhere between two to four million coins, maybe 20 to 25% of the supply um, at the time. Um, that is close to, or in the same range as I think much more precise estimates that have come out. Um, the advantage of those estimates is that they're just much smarter. They're based upon chain analysis and all sorts of sophisticated algorithms and much more knowledge, um, which makes them better estimates in some way, but it also makes them brittle in other ways. And so maybe some of their assumptions aren't quite fair, but it doesn't really matter because um, this precise number is unknowable. We don't know um, how, how, what, how many Bitcoins are lost. A Bitcoin that someone is, is cherishing and just not spending for a decade looks lost, but it isn't. Um, and Bitcoins can be found again, of course, and all these things. But I think net-net, yes, there are probably two to three million Bitcoin that are just lost or destroyed or never going to be found. So when we think about the supply as 18-something million today, it's, it's not. It's 15-something million. Um, does the market know or care? I don't know. I think that starts to touch on areas of economics and valuation and stuff that I don't, I, I, I'm not an expert in. But I know that the market doesn't know how to price Bitcoin, period. So it doesn't surprise me that it doesn't know how to price Bitcoin with the knowledge that 20 to 25 percent of it doesn't really exist anymore. Um, your colleague, you know, whom I've had on my show too, Parker Lewis, who, you know, wrote the series uh, gradually and subtly. Do you see the process of uh, hyper Bitcoinization as a gradual and subtly or unexpected process? Like, <laughs> could that like uh, like happen unexpectedly, theoretically, like this year or next year? Like. Uh, because of the exponential conditions, you know? I, I, I don't know. I, Parker is, is a much better person to pontificate, I think, on ideas like that. He has much more knowledge than I and, and, and depth than I do on these subject areas. Maybe one thing I'll say is, though, I always rather interpret the title of the series, which I love. You know, uh, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great and evocative phrase, gradually and suddenly. But for me, it always... I don't know how he intends it, but for me, it always reminded me not so much of like hyper Bitcoinization, though that's an interesting way to look at it. It reminded me more of like how one becomes a Bitcoiner, that like it's a gradual process. And then you, you, there's like a, a day, a moment, a week, like, you, like, you know, and for me, perhaps it was, it was not really my first conversation with uh, in 2011 that did it for me. Like I had that conversation and felt I understood Bitcoin and then it kind of percolated for years in my mind. And then the next time I checked in was two years later, it was hundred X the price. And I was suddenly like, there's something going on here that I don't understand. And I need to like wisen up because this could be amazing. Um, so like it was gradual and then very sudden that I got interested in Bitcoin. And I think that's a, um, that's how sometimes I interpret uh, the, the title that Parker has given his excellent series of articles is that it's kind of almost about one's reaction to Bitcoin. Um, but coming back to your question, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I just don't know. To me, there's a cyclical nature in this. I kind of see this as waves of cohorts that um, it, it, there's a gradual and then sudden adoption amongst various cohorts. And, and maybe the, you know, pre-2011, you're talking about a very tiny group of people that are all reading, you know, um, similar kinds of mailing lists and have similar interests and, and, and or problems. Um, and uh, you know maybe 2013 or so, like that, that's that's um, the area in which I bought Bitcoin and first kind of joined um, this speculative craze. You're seeing early technologists like myself. Um, I think in 2017, you're starting to see more broadly 
investors <clears throat> and just more you know tech capable individuals. But again, mostly still individuals. And then now in this next cycle, you're beginning to start seeing real businesses um, at scale start like you know obviously Tesla and MicroStrategy some of the biggest examples, but there are others starting to see that happen. Um, and, and within each of those cohorts, it's not been the entire cohort. It's been, you know, some set of early adopters within that cohort. And then within that cohort, there's like the, you know, the late majority and you could sort of trace an adoption curve within each cohort. So in that, uh, in that sense, I, I don't, I think it's a little, probably my guess though, again, folks like Parker and many others would, would be probably more reliable here, but my guess is it's not a gradual and then sudden process of adoption where we just hit some inflection point. Now everything is, you know, hyper Bitcoinized. I think that it happens gradually and then suddenly within cohorts and, you know, uh, geographically and, you know, sort of through the strata of society, um, through these super cycles that are through these cycles or four, or four years that it kind of goes through. Um, it, it, it's, I think what's fascinating is why does it keep doing that? We all know that it does that, but I think that's the whole point, right? Is that no, most people don't know or understand anything about Bitcoin. And so that it that that perhaps these cycles are driven by an internal mechanism, um, which uh, is irrelevant to them. I don't know. Okay, got you. No, very interesting. So, uh, Drew, um, let, let's talk about this article, this three-part series. But maybe we can focus on the third part, on the last one. Uh, uh, sure. what, uh, what did you call it? I'm not. Uh, the the title was the part three was Bitcoin astronomy. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Bitcoin astronomy part three. So what I what I like about your approach is that you 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 somehow lay out describe the fundamental problems with. How should I call it? Conventional mainstream science and technology, or you know, the approach of scientists. And you know what? what uh, there are some quotes, or some maybe some some of them to paraphrasing. Um, uh, so you say in in one of the passages, you say speculation. Uh, I would call it assumptions about extraterrestrial life, biased by our understanding of ourselves. So, and then my question is. So why should it be different when it comes to Bitcoin, blockchain, and proof of work? Because you're saying, you know, that's sort of the the, the fundamental driver, you know, of evolution. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can correct me, but as we go along. <laughs> sure. Yeah, I think the point I'm trying to make there, maybe it's a nuanced one, but it's it's not really a criticism of scientists. Because I think scientists would be the first to, to point out that, yeah, of course, anytime we go look for life out there, we're on some level extrapolating from what we think life is based on us. Um, that, that's an inherently extrapolation is you know, an unreliable process, depending on how you do it and, and what you're extrapolating from. There are ways to do it in more or less sophisticated mechanisms. You made it for Bayesian you know, probability and like a, a structural things that one can use to, to do it a little bit more effectively. But I think scientists would all would all would mostly agree that yeah, this is a um, a process where we bring our biases into it. But we can temper those biases by looking at the data, by by having better scientific theories of of how stars and planets and cells and all these things you know come to form. Um, but I think what I was really trying to raise there is, it's okay that there are those biases. That's not the point. We can we can just admit that those exist. The interesting part becomes. The fact that when we do this, we're inevitably holding up like a mirror to ourselves. There's a wonderful phrase, I think, from Philip Morrison, a professor um, of physics at MIT um, uh, a while back, who, who was you know, uh, a big player in, in a lot of um, kind of the background for SETI and extraterrestrial research and, and um, monitoring out there it, it is, is like, it, it's a mirror, right? Like when we, when we think about what they're like, we're really just describing what it is about ourselves we think is most important or meaningful. Right, so when we say they are carbon-based water chugging, you know, uh, organisms that have sex and reproduce, and um, you know, have inner minds and blah blah, blah. we're making a lot of extract. Like that's that's us. That's what we are. Right. We we don't start from the assumption that they must be a hive mind of slime jellies because that's not what we are. And we want to find things that are like us because a big part of this is valid. We look in the mirror to see ourselves. And so when we apply this mirror to these ideas, we're looking for ourselves again. We're looking at someone that we can communicate with, a mind out there that we recognize. And I think to that extent, I think it's okay to have biases in this process. In fact, that's what makes it interesting. That's what makes different people's speculations like exciting. When I read science fiction, part of what I'm looking for is um, you know a fun story and all that, but like part of what makes, especially I think novels like uh, the dark, uh, the Dark Forest or, or the Three Body Problem series by um, uh, a prominent Chinese um, science fiction author, so interesting is because they almost more more reveal what that author thinks about humanity and what they think about 
us like today, right now, then they actually say anything about science. And I think that's okay. And in this piece, that's what I'm doing. I'm saying I'm increasingly convinced that Bitcoin and blockchains are a hugely impactful and meaningful, important inflection point in human technological, economic, political history. Um, maybe that's an inevitable thing that all societies do. Um, why don't we try to run with that idea? Because actually, this is just going to hold up a mirror to ourselves and Bitcoin and our practice, and it's going to help us understand that better. So I'm essentially uh, in upfront admitting to my biases. So you can't call me out on them later and say, you know, well, you know how, how do you really know that it's a Bitcoin thing? I don't, man. I don't. It's just a bias. and It's a fun game to play. And it's going to teach us about Bitcoin. So let's do it. Um, when you talk about, you know, I mean, you're generally interested in technology and, um, I mean, I guess I, I would, that, that's my assumption, you know, reading your article, are you, are you generally interested in extraterrestrial civilizations or the question like, um, like, do you sometimes ask yourself, because this is the question I'm asking myself, like, how could it be that on some specific fields of technologies, such as digital technologies or AI or, you know, computer information technology, we've advanced really fast, exponentially fast. But on other fundamental levels of technology, would it be transportation, conversion of energy? Um, we, we, we are somehow stuck after even, you know, 100 years of industrial you know, uh, revolution or, or production productivity. Is that something that, some, you know, some, uh, surprises you sometimes? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think there's an analogy to be made there to biological evolution. Like, why is it that there are long periods of relative in, uh, in the fossil record that we recognize a relatively static, you know, bio, like biology and ecology that, you know, things are always evolving, but like there are time periods where there's not a tremendous amount of speciation happening, perhaps that like, uh, I'm not enough of a ecologist or biologist to, to, to give you real figures here. But there, you can compare that against other periods in the fossil record where there's tremendous amounts of change and speciation and the population and creation of new niches. And we can kind of ask that same question, I think. Like, why is that, why is that the history of life? Why is it, you know, periods of relative quiet and then punctuated by, you know, large periods of change? And I'm not necessarily saying that's bimodal like that. There's a distribution there. I don't know what the distribution is. I know that that's probably an ongoing discussion or argument amongst evolutionary biologists. Like there are different models from what I understand. But the point is that like, that is what technology does too, it evolves. And we should expect to see, in my view, relatively long periods of stagnation in certain kinds of technologies and then punctuated equilibria where we see massive amounts of change very quickly. And I think that's, that's pretty normal, right? I, I sometimes think about it like there's a concept of an adjacent possible um, that Stuart Kaufman of, often writes about that I think is helpful to understand the root cause of phenomena like this, which I think are omnipresent. You see it in evolution, you see it in, um, or in biological, technological, and other kinds of evolution. You also see this in all sorts of other systems. And the idea is basically that when we add um, an, a new adjacent possible set of things, uh, we, have, we have some ex existing space of things and we add like a slightly new adjacent possible, like the, the total size of the space now is not incrementally larger. It's multiplicatively exponentially larger because the new things that we've added interact with every existing thing that we have. And so, you know, there are, are I'm going to get the details of these things wrong, but like when I think about the evolutionary um, track record, it's like there's this period, uh, from what I understand, again, not an expert, like the Carboniferous era where we don't have fungi to decompose wood and lignin. And so trees are dying and they're just sitting there. And like nothing's happening and it's piling up and piling up. And then eventually there's something happens. There's a change. Is that change introduced by an environmental change? Is it a statistical mutation that suddenly occurs and then unbalances the system? I don't know. Something changes and you see this big speciation fungi appear and then eat all the world's trees and whatever else. And now the world looks totally different and you have whole new, it's not, and it's not just the trees are gone. You have entire new ecosystems and ecologies that can exist, like enabled by this, you know, new adjacent possible that they've created. And kind of staying on the theme of fungi, right? Like coming to Bitcoin, maybe if if, if you like that connection, um, I think in, in technology we see the same thing, right? That like um, when someone has a really deep new like step forward, they create that adjacent possible of like, hey, we can represent computations using physical things, and we can make that faster and faster and faster and faster to the point where they're doing billions of calculations per second. Oh my God! Now we have like computers and networking, and we've essentially changed the nature of what it means to be human through telecommunications and the internet. Um, and that starts from a very simple seed. Um, and it happens relatively quickly because once we figure out the core ideas of computing and networking, like we can go very quickly, very fast. I think similar things have happened in the history of chemistry and physics, of course, 
um, you know, the rate of progress in fundamental physics has diminished tremendously compared to like this time 100 years ago, right? And, and that's not because physicists are dumber today. It's because we explored that we, we added an adjacent possible of relativity and quantum mechanics and all these cool new ideas. And then that got, you know, we lived that for 100 years. And now we've explored that possibility space. And maybe we're just getting some hints of a new adjacent possible, which is very exciting. But I think Bitcoin is, is like this. It is a new adjacent possible that gives us that multiplies exponentially the, the, the space of new things that we can explore, contemplate, build, be. And that's what's so fun about it is exploring, okay, how does Bitcoin connect to politics, to computer science, to physics, to SETI or aliens or whatever you like. Uh, in my case, maybe the, maybe the last one we speculate about, but one of the first ones that I was um, curious about. So that's what's fun about it. Yeah, the reason I'm asking is that, uh, you know, Safit and Amus also touched upon this in his book or wrote even some articles on how, for example, you know, the, the airplanes, you know, or uh, jet propulsion technology, somehow um, it's it stopped evolving somewhere, you know, with it was, you know, 1971, the Nixon shock, you know, uh, decoupling from the gold standard. Like, do you see like a, a correlation uh, or could not maybe more than a correlation? Do you see like a cause and effect? Uh, like uh, when, you know, uh, for example, when we were, I mean, this is what Safed and Amus also did during his research. He found out that during the gold standard, we had more so-called uh, to, 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 you know, to, to use Peter Thiel's words, zero to one technologies. And in the central bank controlled uh, in collusion with the government uh, fiat banking system, um, we have, you know, we have sort of one too many technologies. Is that something like you see in Bitcoin also? Because this is a topic of high interest to me. Like, what could happen if if we are in the process of hyper Bitcoinization? Could other fields of technologies uh, come out of the, you know, of the closet or uh, which have been maybe already in develop you know, within the military industrial complex? Is that something that uh, that is somehow that you've been thinking about? I, I kind of feel like you know history and and the world. It, it, there's a tendency for a lot of people to to attribute monocausality to to things like this happened because of that thing. It's always true and it's always not true, right? Like everything is connected. Uh, I, I've not uh, read the details of what Safe is saying in some of those arguments, so I'm, I'm not trying to represent or misrepresent his argument. But um, in general, I would say, sure, I'm sure there are a lot of effects that going off the gold standard has had. And some of them you can probably trace very directly, and some of them you can start become more indirect, and and maybe you're maybe you're just promoting a narrative at that point. Um, I think you could just as well say that a lot of the slowdown in technological progress that has happened in certain fields um, is because we exhausted the space of what's possible there, and we're waiting for new ideas. If we come back to evolution, it's not the case that periods of of fantastically faster. Uh, evolution or, or, or speciation or whatever are caused by something that the animals are doing. We're not deciding to like be better and like evolve faster, right? It's a, it's a complex coupling between creatures and their genes and environmental factors and random shit that happens and meteorite comes and explodes things that changes the, the fitness landscape for everybody. And that creates new incentives. Um, it, um, it, it creates uh, incentives, is maybe the wrong word here. It creates different dynamics, right, for how things will evolve going forward. And I think similarly, if you change the incentive structure of the world as Bitcoin is doing, and I think maybe this is the larger point that SAFE and others make, is like incentives really, really do matter. So if you change the nature of incentives, you can change like everything else. And, and sometimes, again, I think that's very, very direct that like, you know, money that is appreciating in value um, chooses, causes you to behave differently than money that's depreciating in, de depreciating in value. I totally understand that, that point. But again, I don't. I, I, I tend to be a little bit less willing to be monocausal. Um, there's a lot of other dimensions that are also going to cause technology to accelerate over the coming century, regardless of Bitcoin. And that doesn't mean that Bitcoin isn't important. It just means that things aren't monocausal. So, like, we're getting into space. That's going to make us better at a lot of things. We're getting good at manipulating genes with technologies like CRISPR and other things that are coming. That's really going to make a difference. We're getting better at AI, specifically perception, but maybe we'll get good at um, you know, more, more interesting aspects of AI too. Um, this is all happening despite Bitcoin and it'll continue to happen in the presence of it. It'll, Bitcoin will change how it happens, but you know, the world is a complex place. And I think Bitcoiners 
sometimes tend to be so passionate and excited about our project that we perhaps want to believe everything, you know, is connected and, and, and touches and Bitcoin fixes this, right? And again, so to, uh, to some extent, that is true. Like the money, you know, fix the money, fix the world. I totally believe this argument, but I think not everything is as direct perhaps as, as some like to make it out. So um, on the whole, like, I think the more interesting question is not so much, will Bitcoin change the world? Yes, it will. Like the more interesting question is how will Bitcoin change every single part of the world and specifically in what way and over what time frame and how much? That's like the more nuanced, interesting question to me. Yeah, you know the the reason I'm asking this is be, is because you know with a sound hardest you know scarcest money is Bitcoin, you know, and with all the monetary properties we could ever wish for, you know, I mean this is the the money that we've been waiting for probably for I don't know for for millennia for for thousands and maybe hundreds of years, like this is the money that 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 I'm, I'm hoping you know this may be a wishful thinking that's going to free up everything. Uh, we could have had, you know, um, uh, under a sound or hard um, uh, monetary system, and so this is um, maybe also my vision is that it 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 could accelerate or, or 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 you know reach that tipping point where every other field of technological innovation could just be you know accelerated. This, you know, what I'm getting at uh, with this. Again, I think it's a direct and indirect thing. So, mm. like, I think some areas are absolutely directly accelerated. Things like energy production. Um, like uh, computer networking, right? Like systems for organizing data and human beings. Um, those are like political engineering is not a class of engineering that was possible before, but it is now. Um, that's very cool. Um, Bill, we're going to learn a tremendous amount about distributed systems and human beings and networks in the next 10 years directly because of Bitcoin. Like that's a very direct connection. I think um, obviously financial technology and all that stuff's completely going to change. Like cryptography, I, I think something amazing is that that the technology to build devices like Trezors and Ledgers has existed for decades, but there was no economic incentive to build them at that scale and, set, and sell tens of millions of such devices. Um, but now there is, right? So you can expect like huge acceleration in personal cryptography, which is a wonderful thing to be happening. Um, cryptography is a net good. It helps people defend themselves against aggressors of all kinds. And so I'm very happy that Bitcoin causes people to have greater access and utility for cryptography. That's a very direct traceable change. I think also energy, right? Like Bitcoin is going to potentially create, um, you know, a kind of a go get for, for huge amounts of energy. Like I, I am an environmentalist and I don't um, like the fact that our energy production pipeline is so dirty. Like the problem in my view is not that we use energy or that we're using more energy because to me that's life and entropy and that's beautiful and that's what it means to be a civilization is to grow. But um, it would be better if our energy were cleaner and more sustainable and that is something that Bitcoin can help us with. And so I see that happening. Um, I also see quantum computing and other kinds of things being kind of fun bogeys for Bitcoin. Like if you had a quantum computer sufficiently powerful today, you could steal all the P2PK coins in theory that are out there, that's a lot of coins. That's like about a million or more Bitcoin are, are, are still locked in P2PK um, addresses from what I recall. Um, what an interesting, uh, like, like, what an interesting bounty. Um, at some point that bounty is so large that it justifies billions and billions of dollars in, in investment, even over and above what's currently being invested in, in, in quantum computing. Um, I think there's an idea, just to continue on that point, that like, um, you know, I speak with, um, professionals like Scott Aronson, for example, here at the University of Texas, and his view is that quantum computing, while cool for all these information, theoretical, blah, blah, blah things, the real practical use where the money will get made when like where it really starts to accelerate is when we start using it for drug discovery. Because unsurprisingly, quantum computing's best application will be simulating quantum mechanics. And so how do, what's, what, what quantum systems would you simulate? Molecules. Like you want to understand proteins, you want to understand drugs, you want to you know, build things that, that's going to require a good quantum computer to do that effectively. That's been his assertion, I think, for a while. But that's a very, in, again, a very indirect. You, you have to build a quantum computer. You got to do a bunch of stuff. Then you got to build the, the drugs. Then you got to sell it. What if you could just steal the Bitcoin? You know, much, much clearer pathway for, for funding your quantum um, computing business. So I think these are all examples of where, where I see very, very direct consequences for these fields of technology. Um, there are probably some other ones that are more indirect, like I think getting to space, I think, you know, biological sciences, I think um, material science, a lot of these areas are also going to be impacted meaningfully, um, but they're just a little bit more indirect. Um, 
uh, ultimately, I think everything is touched, right? Like if you change the money, you change the, the fabric of society in a pretty drastic way. And it's going to have a lot of deep consequences. And I'm, I'm not qualified to articulate all of them, but some of the direct ones I think are quite clear. How far are we? I mean, when we talk about quantum, because I think people like Adam Pack, they're saying, you know, I mean, we're like decades away from quantum computer, <laughs> quantum technologies. Is that's that a, like that's an incentives? That's an incentives question to me. Uh huh. Okay. Right. Like, what are the incentives? I think if we go back to like nuclear fusion. There's a joke in the nuclear fusion community that's always 30 years away. Well, that's because the funding that nuclear scientists have asked for never appears. The reason is because why? Energy is cheap. Gas, gas cheaper than Coca Cola. Like, why do we need to fund nuclear fusion? Um, there's no incentive to put in the money that has been that is required to develop the technology. If the incentive appears, like we'll we'll, we'll get it done. And I think that's that is the change, right? And so perhaps like uh, especially for quantum computing and and in the energy sector, I see like the impact of Bitcoin being a new kind of incentive which spurs investment. And, and that's why I think they're going to be so, so directly affected. Okay, so Drew, what, are, what is from your perspective, like what are the challenges Bitcoin could face? Or, you know, there's a lot of FUD and, you know, it's already been debunked like by so many brilliant articles uh, and, and, and data and facts. But what, from your perspective, are, are there like some aspects that we need to seriously like, think about uh, you know, besides all this, you know, com uh, quantum computer uh, FUD? <laughs> like, what is it that, that the Bitcoin community or or the Bitcoin space needs to somehow deal with in a serious way. I think there are. Um, it, it's a kind of a that's a, itself like a timeline question. There's like what, what's the problem today, and then you know this month and next year, and then you know by the next cycle four years from now, and then there's this decade, and and like there, there's it's it's a it's a scale dependent question in that sense. Um, so I would say in the short term, the things that I'm most concerned about as a Bitcoiner are, you know, custodial risk. Um, I, I, I want more people to use Unchained Capital and multi-sig services and custody their own keys. Um, I think there's, um, we're, we're getting to that kind of bullish manic phase of the market where people just forget that risk exists and they're willing to do all kinds of sloppy things and that can lead to problems. So I think there's some immediate education, things like that that we need to think about. I also think as a Bitcoin community, there's a narrative problem that we suffer from that there's a lot of uptake in Ethereum and altcoins and more quote unquote capable um, tokens and systems that, you know, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about those things. I thought they were cool ones too. I've programmed against them. I no longer find a lot of value in, in, in that part of the crypto um, world. Um, and to some extent, viewed as a tragedy, it's so much time and attention and money is spent on those kinds of projects. Um, I get it. I get why. And I think Bitcoiners could do a better job um, providing a narrative of how Bitcoin will solve the valuable problems that those teams, companies, and projects are working on, but do it in a scalable, sustainable, more solid way on top of Bitcoin. Um, I believe that is possible. I think all, I think many of the things that are getting built like MakerDAO and DeFi's and all kinds of fun distributed file storage and internet schemes and, and all those crazy ideas. These are wonderful ideas. These are not things that we should make fun of. These are obvious things that everyone who first hears about Bitcoin starts to get to and think about. Like they are going to exist. Um, but again, it's a time question. Like we shouldn't be working on them right now because they're impractical. Like if you want to build a, a, a complex user-facing application, you're going to need distri that's distributed on the blockchain or whatever in, in, in I don't like that phrase because I don't think it's on the blockchain, but if you want to build a complex distributed user application, you're going to need distributed data marketplaces and distributed mesh networking. And to support those, you're going to need distributed payments networks and routing mechanisms. To support those, you're going to need really solid money. And so Bitcoin is starting at the bottom and building up in layers to be able to solve all these problems eventually over decades. I think the other coins are are a little bit selling you the idea that they can start at the top and just drill all the way down. But I don't think that's a, that's not a feasible strategy. And so I think sometimes Bitcoiners, I think, have this attitude of have fun staying poor. If you don't have time to understand, I don't have time to explain it to you. And to an extent, like I get it, like there's only so much time you can spend dealing with people who are arguing with you in bad faith and aren't trying to understand Bitcoin. But I think there are a lot of people who work on altcoins or who are interested in them that um, 
come at it in good faith. They, they think that these are good solutions, as I once did years ago, because they are superficially very appealing. And if there were more content out there describing how Bitcoin will get you the same things eventually, um, but in a more solid way, and it's what you really wanted anyway, it might diffuse some of the interest in these projects, or it might help them realize that perhaps all they really are is test beds for things that will be built on Bitcoin um, years from now. I, I sometimes think when these projects um, go through political struggles or, hey, are we going to move to ETH 2.0? Are we going to move our project to Tron or to whatever other chains are out there these days that the kids use? Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're so comfortable moving your project from chain to chain, move it to Bitcoin. You know, 10 years from now, when we have the stack built to support your kinds of projects. And no, they won't be on the blockchain. That's not how it will work. But I think if we could articulate those kinds of plans better as a community, we would we would be doing better. So I, I view that as more medium term concern. Um, longer term, just to kind of uh, finally answer, uh, finish answering your question. Longer term, I actually do think things like quantum computing are a real important threat. Like it is absolutely true today that if you had a sophisticated quantum computer, as I mentioned, you could steal Satoshi's coins or what we believe to be Satoshi's coins and many other P2P coins. How should our community deal with that outcome? I don't know what the solution is. One thing is to do nothing. Just let somebody steal those coins. Make that the quantum computing bounty and go to town. Like that's what it'll be. It'll be worth having quantum computers. It'll be worth not messing with the protocol and changing it in a meaningful way. Um, there's another view too, which is that like we should just set up a soft fork that like does something clever and gives people many, 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 many years to move their coins over, and then at some point locks down the ones that weren't moved so that they can't in full sweep move. You know seven or eight percent of the bitcoin supply um somewhere else um and, and not to mention with it's not just about stealing p2p coins like one, once com quantum computers are really sufficiently powerful um you know they're going to break bitcoin's public private key cryptography which makes it more challenging to spend mm -hmm. um this is a little bit everybody's problem because it's going to break the entire internet um when con quantum computers get that good uh, bitcoin may or may not be the first target but um, everyone will be vulnerable. Perhaps it is Bitcoiners who have the most to lose. And so perhaps it is we who will develop quantum resistant cryptography, and it is we who will insert it into Bitcoin um, proactively. Um, we've led the charge in many other aspects of the application of cryptography over the last decade. So perhaps we continue to do so. But I think that's a underestimated challenge perhaps right now. And it's one that's hard to time because as I mentioned, this is an incentives problem. We already have large companies working on quantum computers and perhaps they think that they're building those quantum computers for drug discovery one day, or they think they're building those quantum computers for op, you know, solving numerical optimization problems or, or some other application use case or something. Um, I, I suspect one day they'll realize they're building them to steal Bitcoin or to, to repossess or claim, you know, uh, what's the phrase that they use? Legitimate salvage, right? <laughs> um, they're gonna make some claim like this perhaps, who knows? Yeah, there were some suggestions that, you know, it's not that of a serious problem. I don't know whether it was Adam Back or Giacomo Zucco. Uh, they said, you know, we could eventually uh, once, you know, that the threat of uh, quantum uh, computing is, is become serious, we could transition to another uh, cryptographer, you know, cryptography uh, level. Yes, I, I, I agree. It is, it is not a short term problem. And right. I think it's a long term problem to worry about. OK, gotcha. So, um, oh yeah, there was one point you made a pretty good point. I mean, as much as I or many other Bitcoiners would want, you know, people to to be totally, you know, self-sovereign, hundred percent self-sovereign, self-custodial Bitcoiners. Um, I mean, the reality is most people, especially you know, in the older generation, they are not ready to fully self-cust, and I think that's it's so great that services like Unchained Capital do exist. Which you know just help them you know take them by the hands and 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 so they can you know really take care of the security of their of their Bitcoin. So it's good that you know servers of Bitcoin that Gunshin Capital exists because otherwise uh, I'm not sure whether pe most people are really ready for 100% because it's a total mind shift. It's a paradigm shift, like in thinking. Is that is that what it is? I certainly feel that way for myself. I'm an Gunshin Capital user. Um, and I will describe that, um, you know, something like Unchained had existed perhaps four years ago when we were building Unchained, we would have just used it. I don't think we set out to be a custody company or we didn't want, I remember even saying the phrase, I don't want to write a wallet here. I just want to start building financial services for Bitcoiners. Um, 
but it turned out we needed to build that because it was not possible to do multi-sig in a, in a defensible way in 2016 when we started, except if we were willing to do it ourselves. It certainly wasn't possible to do what we call collaborative custody, um, working with our own clients in the same multi-sig configurations. I mean, even Coinbase uses multi-sig at this point internally, um, but you don't get to be part of their multi-sig. That's not how it works. Non it's not collaborative. It's custodial. And so that's the huge difference at Unchained is our goal is not to take your Bitcoin. Um, it's not to replace your role in securing your Bitcoin. It's to collaborate with you and, as much as you want us to and need us to, um, to make sure the Bitcoin stays safe. And we've already saved hundreds, if not thousands of Bitcoin from loss due to the fact that people make mistakes, that they're not bad people, they're not stupid people, stuff happens. Um, and people get attacked, people get hacked. We've had people email accounts hacked into, then they try to get into their unchained. Um, they sometimes have or do not have 2FA set up, but there are ways around that. We don't do SMS-based 2FA, but um, there are some mechanisms. If the person didn't have 2FA set up or, or, or um, we had one case where uh, a, a hacker got into a customer's account months before and then saw them create the account at Unchained and then used that as an opportunity to get in, these things happen. And it's very hard even for you know, technically competent people to secure computer systems like email and other forms of access, much easier to store keys. And so when these, these unfortunate clients have had these incidents, they, we haven't lost any Bitcoin because hackers can't get to their keys. That's a physical thing that they have to do. You can't do that through the network. And we've designed our entire platform to ensure that all our clients have these air gapped, um, in some cases, in other cases, hardware wallets, um, at least offline um, keys. And then they collaborate with Unchained. So if they're hacked, if they're attacked, if they lose a key, if something breaks, there's always a pathway or, or as long as they react to it quickly enough, you know, they don't wait three months later for a second event to occur. Um, we can help them recover. Um, and that's a powerful thing. Um, there are some trade-offs, you know, we collaborate with them, which means we know about their balances and their addresses. Um, that's, that means this is not an anonymous service. It's still private because no one else knows about that information. They choose to share that with us and we only know what they choose to share with us. There are some evolutions of our product where we could be more close to anonymous over time. But right now, this is where we're focused. Um, to me, I view this as like um, the, the right way ultimately for all Bitcoin to be stored is in some form of collaborative construct. Now, not every person needs to be collaborating with a company. Sometimes you might just collaborate with your friends, your family. Um, but the software and the practice needs to be developed to make that easy, ubiquitous, and simple. Um, until then, companies like ours are going to be vital for getting people to be able to do this. Um, and just I'll say for anyone in the audience, um, if you're custodying your coins on, on Coinbase and such, you, you, you know, and they're a significant amount, you should know better, right? Not your, not your keys, not your coins. Um, get them to a, a self-custody method. Go get a Trezor, cold card, ledger, you know, a device and start using one. Um, if you're using one of those devices and it's got a lot of Bitcoin on it, maybe it feels heavy to you. That's how mine used to feel. Like there was a point where, you know, this device is worth more than the home that the device is in. This is starting to get crazy. Um, and I didn't realize how much stress I had having that single point of failure. Like that was a deep worry that, that I sat with for a long time without admitting it to myself. And I remember finally when we Unchained built our vault product and I was able to get my coins into a multi-sig setup. Now they're geogra the keys are now geographically separated. There's no single point of failure. I'm never going to be in a position where all my keys are in one geographical location where I'm located and it can be attacked ever, ever. Um, I realized what a weight was lifted from my shoulders. Um, and I think that's what I would like to see um, more Bitcoiners get to. It's just feeling more at ease, man. And then um, over time, Unchained uh, will be launching you know, more iterations on our products. So inheritance, retirement, um, all the things that go alongside like having a professional banking partner, which is, you know, not, uh, we're not a bank today, but it's the kind of, you know, value added custody that I think, you know, is important to provide to Bitcoiners. Um, the trick is not to take away their custody while you try to provide the value. And I think unfortunately too many other companies don't really pay attention to that part. They kind of skip over it and they assume that, hey, in order to get you what you want, just give me the Bitcoin and I'll kind of do the rest. And we don't like that approach. We, we prefer to engineer against the protocol itself, to build collaborative constructs, to use Bitcoin smart contracts, if you'd like, to encode the obligations of financial instruments. And we think that's a clever and smart way to program human beings, not machines, to do the right thing.
Yeah, it's a great product to be honest with you. I mean, because most people, I'm just you know, they're just used you know to this legacy system system, and they want to have something or somebody or you know an institution or a structure you know taking care of of whatever that is, security, uh, privacy, and and you know ease of comfort, right? Uh, so. Let's go back to your article, uh, Drew. You wrote uh, somewhere you said Bitcoin's constraints are not limitations that civilizations eventually evolve or innovate past. What do you mean by that? Um, I think that's a common theme um, in a lot of areas is that it, interpreting a constraint not as a limitation, but as an important rule of play. And I think you know, we see that in, in physics, there's a, a famous example of it in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I, I think there's a, 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 I'm gonna forget now, I'm gonna attribute it poorly, but there's someone who said that like, you know, a, a complete conspiracy is itself a law of nature. Um, I, I think about laws like, like any attempt to get around this, get around this constraint that physicists were discovering about like, oh, you can't know all these things at once about particles. Surely that's because we're just not being clever enough. There must be a path through. We must be able to find out like the, the world has an ontological weight and reality to it, right? We thought. And so turns out though, that's not our modern understanding. We believe that that constraint um, is built into the fabric of the universe. There's no way around it. And in fact, maybe that's good because it its presence causes a lot of quantum behavior that is really deep and rich. Um, you can similarly think about the speed of light. Like it would be nice if it were infinite because then we would be able to go anywhere we wanted. But the consequence would be if something bad happens somewhere in the universe, there's no speed limit preventing it from getting to us. So the idea of the speed of light being rather slow actually compared to the physical scale of the universe and how long it would take light to traverse it, um, it sort of means the universe is spread out, right? It means it's big. It means that something way over there can't hurt us over here. That's a deep and important aspect, I think, about the world um, and the universe that is underappreciated is that it's just big. It's not small. Um, and that's that's because of the constraint of the speed of light being so small. So constraints sometimes give us properties that we really cherish and desire in systems. Um, and I think we see that in technology as well. Um, like in, in databases, for example, there's a common construct of the, of the uh, append-only log. This is a constraint we adopt. Like when we write data, we append it to a log. If you want to delete something that you wrote earlier, you don't back up to the log and then delete that line. You just write a new delete. And you're never, therefore, modifying what you wrote to the log. You're only ever appending new data to it. This is a constraint. Like it's, you're not as free as you would be if you could write arbitrary kinds of manipulations of this data structure. But it turns out adopting this constraint simplifies the nature of distributed systems so tremendously that they're able to scale up with our feeble human minds and not have bugs. And so in some sense, constraints are rules of play that enable behavior that we want to have. And so when I think about Bitcoin, I think I see it as having constraints. That's true. Um, those constraints shouldn't necessarily be viewed as limitations to be overcome because they provide us properties that are valuable, right? The fact the block size is limited means that there is a market for transaction fees. Like that's an important aspect of Bitcoin's long-term security. It's not a limit to be overcome. It's something to be understood and worked around. Similarly, when we think of proof of work, every attempt that we come up with to subvert proof of work, because you know we don't like wasting energy. I, I mentioned previously, I don't think that's a, a valid stance, um, but every attempt to get around proof of work has suffered from some sort of weakness long-term malleability, like the, the, the fact that the proof of work chain of Bitcoin is self-verifying. This is something that comes up actually in part three of the article is like, you, you, we, we, you can't fake the amount of energy that went into Bitcoin, you know, more or less, right? You, you sort of know that there's a certain amount of work there. In a totally proof of stake based blockchain, there's, there's no such guarantees. And so perhaps this idea, uh, another idea is random number generation that ultimately proof of work blockchains are incredibly good, secure distributed random number generators. Um, which is an important aspect, keeping the selectorate of people who make decisions about consensus changes fair and valid and changing over time. Um, in proof of stake systems, there's not, it, it's just hard to generate really good distributed random numbers. We don't have meaningful algorithms that don't, for example, advantage the last person to participate in a round of random number generation or some other kind of thing like this, right? And so Perhaps it turns out that the constraints of proof of work and other things that are built into Bitcoin, again, are not limitations to be overcome, but they're important rules of play. 
right? They create behaviors that we think are valuable. And I think when it comes to some of their writing on, on the astronomy stuff, like the fact that Bitcoin uses energy means that it couples to our energy infrastructure. That's good, not bad, right? That means it, transform, it has a, a more direct path to transforming that same energy infrastructure, which we desperately need here on Earth and, and, and increasingly, hopefully, outer in space. Um, so again, when we misunderstand constraints as limitations, like we don't understand the rules of play and where you know the ball is moving around and we're losing track of the game, we're trying to revise the rules. Like that's, that's, that's missing the play on the field. We need to be moving past this idea that uh, just as a community more broadly, that there's something wrong with constraints. We need to embrace them and we need to build on them. Like they help us. Yeah, I want to respect your time, uh, Drew. You, you, your article is, is also pretty, what do you call it, like hilarious to read sometimes because <laughs> there are some quotes in there where you say sort of, I'm just paraphrasing, it's like, we, if we don't hyper-Bitcoinize, you know, as fast as possible, we are, you know, it's sort of a, a um, have fun staying poor on a galactical level, something like that. So <laughs> it's pretty funny, you know, how you wrote it. Uh, it's your sense of humor. I just love it. Are there any essential points or conclusions like you want to like you want to make uh, in connection with this article? Like, do you want to like give some uh, maybe share your thoughts, like what people uh, what did you what, what was your purpose or your motivation to write this article? Maybe. Sure. Yeah, I, I'll, it, it touches on some of the things we've been talking about, like, again, um, you know, the speed of light is a constraint of the physical universe. Proof of work is a constraint built into Bitcoin. How do these constraints interact is something I've been thinking about for a long while. Um, part of that is just I'm a physicist and inevitably I, I want to take one value to infinity or to zero and I want to ask what the system does. Like exploring systems at their extremes is a great way to understand what kinds of behaviors they're capable of. It's a common technique that physicists often use to simplify a problem. Um, so I like thinking that way. Um, to summarize the series, uh, I would say that I'm trying to track like how Bitcoin and blockchains grow. And then like, and in parts one and two, I'm essentially trying to make the argument that like, as we grow through space, like this is not, has nothing to do with earth. Like this is very impractical stuff. Bitcoin is perfectly great on earth. We're never going to need anything other than Bitcoin on earth. And I, part of what I have loved about this article series is some people label me a shit coiner for um, some of the stuff that I get into and that's like, whatever, I don't mind it. <laughs> It's, it's, totally, it's totally fine. I don't, I don't mind at all. Um, but just to reiterate, yeah, Bitcoin is all we're going to need on Earth for a long, long, long time. And um, But increasingly, as we get out into space, we get to Mars, we get to other places, that, that idea of the speed of light is finite, that Bitcoin's block time is 10 minutes, that space is very, very big. It's going to create some tensions. And my argument is that in, 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 in the concrete, um, Bitcoin mining will not be possible very far from Earth. And then in sort of the less concrete, more speculative um, uh, way, uh, that will mean that people will want to build their own blockchain because mining is valuable because uh, Bitcoin, proof of work, energy production are all connected in my view. And that virtuous cycle of optimizing your energy infrastructure through the market for proof of work um, and the usage of energy therein is really valuable for societies. And if Martians or Saturnians or whomever can't accomplish that for themselves, they're going to build their own, well, with Bitcoin, they're going to build their own blockchain. So that's kind of part one. And then part two, uh, or, or part one is when we get to Mars and other planets, we're going to want to build similar Bitcoin-like blockchains there, and that's going to be stable and it's going to be fine. Um, and then part two is really saying, well, okay, well, let's let's take it another kind of step up. Um, what about like blockchains that are separated, not in space, but more in time, right? So by time scale, right? Uh, in part one, we kind of make a connection between the blockchains block time and how big it can be. So Bitcoin's block time is 10 minutes, so it can only ever be like about, you know, big enough to cover a planet, at least in terms of where you can mine it, um, which means the energy that's available local to planets can be effectively integrated by a planetary size blockchain. But there's tons of energy in space that's far away from where people live, just like there's tons of energy on Earth that's far away from where people live. On Earth today, that energy can be captured by Bitcoin miners because they can move to East Texas, they can move to the middle of the ocean, they can harness the wind and the waves and the sun, and they can make Bitcoin. Um, that, that's because Bitcoin is planetary size it covers the whole planet. Um, if we want to capture the energy that's floating in asteroids and the, in the Kuiper belt, if we want to collect all the energy that just streams out of the sun into space for forever and ever, if we want to just capture all of that, we're going to need a blockchain that is the size of the solar system. Because otherwise, 
it won't be able to incentivize the collection of that energy due to the effects of you know blockchains having a limited size. Such a blockchain needs a block time of many, many years or, or, or months. Um, that changes the monetary policy. It's no longer you know, 100 or 140 years to produce 21 million coins. It might be 100,000 years or a million years to produce that same coin. This is starting to be money. Um, oh, and a block you know, won't confirm in 10 minutes or an hour. It's going to confirm in months or a year. Um, this is a time scale. Uh, oh, and, and, and just to complete the thought, um, and you know, proof of work mining, proof of work mining near a planet, you, know, you have Bitcoin, it's already a large amount of energy. I think it's going to keep growing to a certain extent, um, but it's only ever going to be so big. Um, if you're mining at this you know, solar system scale, you can use a lot more energy. And so I, I view these, this, this is sort of like, you know, blockchain can be separated in space, they can also be separated in scale. And so you can have them nested inside of each other, that there can be like one on Earth, one on Mars and various places. And then just this ginormous one that covers the whole solar system for all, all of humanity to use, um, you know, on the millennium long time scale of, you know, immortal, you know, solar system elite or whatever you'd like in your science fiction. Um, but, and you could take this further. You could go and say, well, what about multiple star systems? How do we get those to connect? And it's a fun game to play to, to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, in part three, I sort of say, hey, that was so fun. Like, if you believe that whole story, then you then maybe you believe that Bitcoin is this thing that gets us to become a more capable and larger civilization. It's perhaps evolutionarily uh, an advantage that we've accumulated Bitcoin and we thought of it. It's now going to propel us outward and, and onward, and therefore we're more fit as a result. So then that starts to lead me to ask, is that a general thing? And now we're kind of back to the mirror question. Well, if Bitcoin is so interesting and important to me and, and here on humans, well, maybe it's important to all species. Maybe it's inevitable that they'll discover it. Uh, maybe they'll go through hyper-Bitcoinization. Maybe that's what gets them to expand through their solar system and nearby, just as I theorize it will to us. And then the question, of course, becomes, well, well, what happens if we see them and we interact with them? Are we interacting as species? And my argument is that perhaps this is one of the most compelling things about Bitcoin and blockchains is I actually believe that blockchains are the most natural language to use for two alien species that have no idea about each other to communicate with. They're finite, they're, com they're computer programs, they're legible, um, their rules are, you know, their, their details could be very different, but the shape of what a, a, what a blockchain has to do to provide its essential core function is potentially very generic and simple. Um, and I go through in part three, lots of reasons why I believe if we do ever see a signal from outer space, it will be a blockchain. That is that is the thing that it will be. It won't be a picture uh, or, or or echoed video of Hitler like we had in you know Contact that movie or whatever. It'll it'll be a blockchain. Um, and it, then it, of course it, it and you can read the article to kind of understand why. Or we can go into it a bit. And then of course I close by saying um, and the reason we haven't heard from this is more of a joke, but like the reason we haven't heard from them is because th they think we don't know what blockchains are yet. They haven't. We have to send them ours Guys. and then they'll see other, these guys. Okay. I get it. I get it. They, they, they speak the language. Okay. We'll, we'll send them ours mm -hmm. because theirs is this amazing intergalactic blockchain or whatever you like or something like that. So um, it's very speculative stuff, but I do think it's a fascinating question to ask about, you know, the universality of certain technologies or evolutionary adaptations, you know, like sexual reproduction or uh, multicellular, multicellularity or even Bitcoin. I think these are fun questions to ask. And on some level, I think, um, we make a lot of assumptions as we were discussing that like any alien species out there are like they're going to have radios and telescopes like if, if we're willing to make those kinds of assumptions around what technology they have why is it unrealistic to assume that they'll also develop bitcoin is bitcoin such a weird human only thing maybe it's not maybe it's universal and if it is what does that mean about like society and what does it mean for you know interspecies uh uh interaction at the universal scale so they're just fun ideas to explore yeah, you know, sometimes when I read your article about, you know, you mentioned the SETI organization that, what is, what is it called, Search for Extraterrestrial uh, Intelligence. And, you know, organizations who are, are structures like NASA and, and SETI, sometimes they seem to me as sort of a front, public relation front organizations, just to show the public, you know, we're doing something, but we can't find anything. You know, it's like, but, you know, it's just my, my own uh, sort of uh, line of thoughts. Um, so one another thought I had is like uh, you you know you talked about Nakamotians or Nakamotans. Uh, I'm like, can we can we really exclude that that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was not an extraterrestrial? Or what do would you would you say he's definitely you know a human being? He's just you know flesh and blood. <laughs> oh, you know, well, just having never met 
having never met the person, I, I, I can't say for sure. You know, <laughs> I have a Bayesian prior about this, that they're almost certainly were human. Um, I think there's other fun questions, like were they a time traveler? We don't know. That's a fun one. I like, yeah. I like, I like people who, who play with that theory. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I think it's what there, there are two mysteries that I feel like I'm essentially fascinated by. Like if I'm in the shower, I'm just like zoning out. I'm thinking about like one of two things. And, and one is who is Satoshi? Like, this is just such a fascinating question. And the second is, where are the damn aliens? Like, it's, 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 that's how my brain is. These are two fascinating subject areas for me. And that's, there's a reason I started writing articles like this. But um, no, net net, I don't think Satoshi's an alien. I already think so many crazy things. I can't add that one to my list. Have you ever thought like writing a script for a movie? This is what sometimes intrigues me. It's like nobody, it's such a such a such a phenomenal story about such a, the whole thing is so phenomenal. I mean, I wish it's just maybe a technique. Uh, maybe I'd have to learn. But why hasn't anybody made a movie like an authentic thriller or doc, a real like good documentary? It could like be a huge blockbuster. Why hasn't anybody done that yet? Thing because truthfully bitcoin is early and we're all nerds and no one has any idea what we are talking about so i think the movies will get made i, I think even go back a step why isn't there good content about bitcoin yeah why isn't there a movie about satoshi like forget the alien stuff like like there's so many fascinating things that have happened in the history of bitcoin that it deserves like just an incredibly good television show um, my wife is a, is a aspiring television writer. Who has, really, who's, who's, great. Who is uh, who I've been bothering for many years to write that show, oh. and she finally did. And it's and it's a very cool show. And she's uh, you know she's got a great pilot that she's been working on, and, and is having some initial success, like kind of marketing around instead of Hollywood. But um, you know Hollywood doesn't understand Bitcoin, so that's something we sometimes commiserate over. It's yeah. like yeah. Um, they don't, I don't think perhaps they they realize what, how amazing her script is quite yet, and her and her and her script is really just about. Bitcoin. Um, I think give it 10 to 20 years. Let, let us learn more about Bitcoin. That's and then you will, start seeing it. <laughs> yeah. you will start seeing it pop up like in the James Bond movie that it's the MacGuffin. And, you know, the, I see that occasionally now, but it'll be it'll be omnipresent. It'll be yeah. like the, the, the number one thing that they're stealing in heist movies is, is is private keys. Right. I think once we get to that point, then you can start to entertain these much more um, speculative, fun ideas about how aliens uh, will use Bitcoin or whatever. Like, I think that's a little bit too many steps for most people yeah. to, to, yeah. <laughs> to cover right now. But Drew, I mean, I really tried. I, I actually, you know, formed a group. I brought out, you know, the, a lot of Bitcoiners, well-known Bitcoiners together. I wrote a script, but I don't know. It somehow it dissolved. The whole project dissolved, which I find really pity. But, uh, you know, as you said, maybe it just takes time and, and maybe it needs some kind of uh, special crowdfunding or, or special producers, you know, executive producers who just come in and see the value, you know, of this of this of this project. So telling, um, telling stories as well is, is hard. Telling stories well yeah, is hard. It is, yeah, definitely. Uh, so, Drew, uh, where can people find you? Uh, any anything coming up? Any articles? Any links? Resources? Infos you want to tell my listeners? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, when, I, when I write, I usually write either on my Twitter, so you can Google me, Drew, D-H-R-U-V, Bansal, B-A-N-S-A-L. I'm, I'm on Twitter. You can give me a follow. Um, if I write longer pieces, they're almost always on Unchained Capital's blog, which you should be a regular subscriber of anyway. We have incredible good content there from the whole team, including my colleague Parker. Uh, his Graduating Suddenly series is, is the number one resource. I always send people who are new to Bitcoin to kind of understand it. Um, I will be speaking at Bitcoin 2016, or 2016, oh my gosh, 2021. I'm, I got the wrong years here. I'll be speaking at Bitcoin 2021 here coming up next month. Um, at along the with a bunch of folks yeah. on the chain. I wish yeah, I that's could right, come. in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited for it. I've been pretty um, inactive over the last year in terms of public stuff, this pandemic and all that. So, mm -hmm. but you know, I'm getting back out there now and, and I'm really, really looking forward to this conference. Um, and I'll be speaking with uh, Ryan Gentry from uh, Lightning Labs. Um, we, we're going to talk a little bit on some of the stuff I described around Bitcoin and stacks and layers and kind of more narrative work about how I think um, a lot of things will ultimately be built on top of Bitcoin one day, not in Bitcoin's blockchain, but but enabled by it. So we're getting we're giving a talk about about those kinds of ideas of Bitcoin 2021, which I'm really excited about. Um, I feel like everyone knows me as this weird Bitcoin space fellow now, which is totally fine. I, 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 I branded myself that way. Um, but I think there's I actually don't know that I have too much more to say about space anymore. I feel like I've said all that can be said, at least that I have thought of. And I'm actually very excited to move on to other um, areas that I've been meaning to write about for a while, like you know this Bitcoin stack stuff um, and other things. But if you're interested in following that stuff, just you know, if, if you're not able to come to Bitcoin 2021, I'm sure 
will be tweeting and writing articles about the same stuff, and there's probably lots of video. But in general, yeah, to stay abreast of um, me and what Unchained is doing, just follow our blog and follow our Twitter. Well, really enjoyed our conversation, Drew. Uh, hope we can meet sometime in person. I'm, unfortunately, I can't make it yes. uh, in June, but you know, uh, I'm gonna definitely watch the the talks, the, you know, the, the discussions going on in Miami uh, via YouTube or whatever. So thank you so much again. I'll you know talk to you soon. Thanks, Kevin. This was all really. Hey, so how'd you guys enjoy this episode with Drew Banzal? This is a really phenomenal talk, and um, I hope you you know were able to extract something for yourself out of this conversation it uh really sometimes mind-blowing to think about you know bitcoin and going down the rabbit hole you know i'm still convinced bitcoin is the key to a, a totally new paradigm shift to a totally new you know scientific technological uh monetary economical and even spiritual you know evolution it will usher you know into zero to one technological innovation it will speed up a lot of things not only the digital realm but also in every other field you can think of would it be you know transportation energy uh, longevity genetics i mean whatever you can think of so make sure you follow drew Pansal on twitter read his articles it's really excellent and uh, subscribe to you to my youtube channel to my podcast platform and follow me on twitter let me know your questions, your comments, any suggestions for future talks or panel discussions. And I'll see you soon again. Talk soon.